Hello. Today we're going to look at using the two-phase simplex algorithm. Earlier in this class, we've, we've thoroughly dove into how to use the simplex algorithm to optimize um, linear programming problems. So today, we're looking at this problem, and so far it looks pretty much like all the other problems that we've done. We want to maximize some objective function, and we have some constraints that we're subject to. Okay, so if we tackle this the typical way, first we'd usually want to add slack variables so that we can turn all of these inequalities into equations because to use the simplex algorithm, we would like these things, or this whole linear programming problem, to be in standard form. The standard form means I need equations and I need all the variables to be non-negative. And so if I add my slacks in, notice the only difference from usual is that these are greater than or equal to constraints. That's not a huge deal. When I add in those slacks, these are actually going to get subtractions and be minus a slack to keep these equations equivalent to these inequalities where the slacks have to be positive. So that's not horrible. And we may say, well, let's just keep rolling with this. That's fine. So here we go, here's our simplex table, and you look at this and something looks funny here and here. Typically what we have is an identity column with a positive one. And what this identity column means is that these non-identity columns, remember these variables are not basic variables, they are not in the basis, and the ones that have these pretty identity columns are. So wherever the one is, you look across, so slack one is equal, or slack three, sorry, is equal to five. But this is not a positive one. This is not what we're used to. Something's wrong here. Well, what if we take a very naive approach? And you say, well, we're allowed to do row operations. What if I were to multiply both of these constraints through by negative 1? That should fix this and give us positive ones. That sounds like a lovely idea. Let's try it. Well, I did it. And so, see, I have positive ones here now. I feel happy. But look at this. Oh, no. I'm not allowed in the simplex algorithm to have anything equal to negative values, any of the variables set to something negative. So this is not going to work. That's not allowed. That means that we're not feasible. We're not in a feasible spot. Let me give you a visual of what's happening. So typically, if I have a linear programming problem and I add constraints in, everything stays in the first quadrant because all the x values have to be non-negative. So I'm stuck in the first quadrant here. And as I add constraints, they build out my feasibility region. Now remember, the way the simplex algorithm works is it cycles from basic feasible solution, or corner point, or intersections of constraints, to adjacent intersections of constraints until it finds the optimal. And so if I add a few constraints, you see this weird pie shape. I don't know what you want to call it, maybe like a sword or some some four-sided shape here. I have one, two, three, four extreme points. And this would be nice. Usually we always start with all the slacks as our basis, and that's starting at the point zero, zero. That's called the trivial starting solution. Well, what happens with these greater than or equal to constraints is sometimes when you add them in, they cut off this beautiful starting solution. And so I'm trying to start here, but it's not feasible. My feasibility region is in here. Now the simplex algorithm is guaranteed to keep you feasible if you are feasible, but it is not guaranteed to push you into feasibility. It's just going to find me intersection points, so it could pivot to something like down here or right here, but it might, it might not ever pivot into feasibility. So that's a problem. I need to somehow fix this feasibility issue. That's why we have the two-phase simplex. So here's the idea. What if we, well, let's go back to this original table here. I would really love to have an identity column that had a positive 1 in it, just all zeros and a 1 to take up this value of 2. And, and I just don't have it anywhere. So what if I were to just introduce dummy variables, or what we will call artificial variables? They don't really have any meaning to the original problem besides just whether we are that basically they're measuring how far out of feasibility we are. But if we can put those artificial variables in, that would give us at least something to start with. Okay, so we add these artificial variables. 
And that's lovely, they can take these values for us. But now that I've added these weird dummy variables to the problem, I'm not quite sure what to make the cost. Well, I have an idea. We don't want these to be in our basis, but they're going to have to start out in our basis so that our simplex algorithm will work. What if there was a way to make these really unattractive? Okay, we're doing a maximization problem. You can do this with any flavor, maximization or minimization. The idea is, let's make the cost on these so that they're unattractive. Well, what's one way to make sure they're always unattractive is let's just strip away all the other cost. Okay, so we'll let everything else have a cost of zero. I know that's not our original problem, but this first half of the, of the problem, this first half of the two phase is only to get us to a feasible point. So we'll worry about the objective function once we're feasible. So for now, we're just gonna give all of these values of zeros and let's make these unattractive. We can give them values of one or negative one, depending on whether you would like to minimize or maximize. Most textbooks minimize this new objective function with two phase, but it really does not matter as long as you make these unattractive. So I'm gonna go with maximizing just to keep the same flavor. And so I gave them unattractive objective functions. Because this is in row zero form, these are all opposite signed of the objective function. So technically I gave it a negative one coefficient, but when I put it in row zero form, we change the signs, we subtract them over to the other side. So positive ones, they're unattractive. Now this still doesn't look right. Do you see this column right here has ones and zeros, but then it has an extra one up top. If it's a basic variable, it should look like slack three here. It should have a cost of zero and should have zeros and a one. This almost looks the same, but I have these ones here. So I can't quite say these are artificial one and artificial two yet. What we have to do is called updating the cost, okay? That's when I just need to use row operations to zero out the cost above each of these artificials. So I'm just gonna take this whole first row, multiply by negative one, and add it up. Now that will change these values as well. And then I'll need to do it again for the second row. I'll need to zero out this cost above artificial two. So I'll multiply this whole row by whatever I need, negative one, and then add it up. That will add some to our objective function, as well as adding some to these other costs. Okay, so I will do that. And we have now updated the cost. And now look at how beautiful these things look here. This is now my basis, slack three and artificial one and artificial two. Beautiful basis. So these now can be who takes the values of two, one, and five. Okay, lovely. Now I will just go about my business looking for what's most attractive, performing my ratio test, and just using the simplex algorithm as usual. If you do not know how to use the basic simplex algorithm, these next few steps may not make sense to you, and you may need to look for how to do the simplex algorithm. But for an optimi a maximization problem, if I write these in row zero form, I'm gonna look for the most negative and say that's my attractive variable. So this is the most negative, so x1 is attractive. I think I have that more set out here on the next table. Notice I just copied this over. <clears throat> so this is the most attractive, so I'm gonna let x1 enter the basis. Well, then I need to perform a ratio test. Right-hand side divided by entry, right-hand side divided by entry, and right-hand side divided by entry. The smallest of those ratios is our candidate to leave. The smallest ratio there is one divided by one. So A2 will leave the basis. So X1 is going to kick out X2 and take its place. What we will do then to, to make X1 a basic variable is we will use row operations to make this a one and everything above and below it, including the cost, everything else has to be zeroed out using just row operations. So we'll multiply this by two and add it up to the cost. We'll multiply this by negative one and add it up to the first row. We'll multiply by negative one and add it to the bottom row. And I don't need to divide or multiply because it's already one. So after we make that pivot, this is the table that we are at. Now this, see how beautiful this is. Oops, did not mean to highlight all that. This is now <clears throat> a perfect identity column. 
and where the one is, that's what x, um, that's the row that we're saying is being represented by x1. It has a value of one. So we're at this current point. x1 is one. x2, slack one and slack two are non-basic. Slack three is still on the basis at four. And artificial one is still on the basis. A few things to notice. Our objective function value did improve because we're trying to maximize up. So we went from negative three to negative one. That's good. We kicked one of the artificials out of the basis and we still have one in there. So let's perform another um, pivot. Let's look to see if anything else is attractive. And I have two things attractive. So typically we go with what's called lexicographical order to break ties. We go with the one that just we come to first, usually alphabetical then subscripts, or you can just go in the order of the problem. So I'm going to go with X's first before S's. Um, it does not really matter. You could pivot on either of these. But we're going to go with the X first. It's attractive. That's attractive. They're the same amount of negatives, so we're going to go with this one. Ratio test, if you do all the right-hand sides divided by the entries, X2 is the, um, sorry, the first entry is going to replace A1. So X2 is going to enter, and it's going to replace A1. So we'll make this pivot. Once again, we'll need to zero out above and below anything that's not zeroed out to make this entire row, or column, sorry, an identity column. So after performing that pivot, notice that now nothing is attractive. We have no negative reduced cost. That's good. That means we should be about at the end of phase one. But we need to check. Do we still have any of the artificials in the basis? Neither of these look like identity columns. Let's look over here. X2, X1, and Slack3. Those are my basic variables. So we can be really excited about this. Because what this means is I have pushed these artificials out of the basis. That means I have pushed myself into a feasible point. I am now feasible to the original problem. Now, the way these are designed, these artificials will never be attractive again. I can purely, I can just drop all these artificials from my problem now. They, are, they served no real re meaning for us. They are now finished. I am done with them. I can throw them away and have a simpler table of just X values and slacks. And so I will copy down all this white part of the table and carry it over, I guess, and these what is basic. Down. So I'm finished with phase one. That's great, right? Yay, now what? <clears throat> so we drop the artificials and we have this table here. But notice, I don't know what the costs are. There's a slight problem here. I have original cost of the problem I can put there, but they have not been pivoted with us. We've done all these matrix operations and the cost has not been tagging along. So Let's put back in the original cost, 2x1 and 1x2. Remember, we subtract them over. And so these are the original cost, and the slacks all had cost of zeros. Now, once again, we're going to want to update the cost like we did the first time. Hit a timeout on the problem, and let's scroll back up to where we did that. Remember what I said was all the basic variables should have zeros above them, so we would need to use a row operation to zero out these cost, we're going to do that same thing. We're going to use row operations to zero out these costs. Well, lucky for us, this one's already zero. So we only need to zero out x1 and x2's cost, which looks pretty simple. I can multiply this row by 2 and add it up. I could multiply this row by 1 and add it up, and that would zero out these cost. Notice that would not affect this one. That would still be zero. And so if I do that, I've now updated the cost. That is the one thing that people don't like about the simplex, or the two-phase simplex algorithm, is that each phase beginning, you have to put in some cost and update them. At phase one, we put in these costs were all zeros and unattractive ones for the artificials, and then we had to update before we could do any simplex pivots. And at phase two, we put back in the original cost and had to zero out the basic ones, the basic variable cost, before we can now just mosey on with our simplex algorithm. Okay, so we're now at a feasible point. I can go on with trying to finish my simplex algorithm. So we look for the most attractive. Once again, there's a tie. So I'll go with the lexicographical, the S1 order here. So this one, we'll let S1 enter. 
We'll perform ratio tests. We don't bother doing ratio tests on negative or zeros, so I don't actually have to do a ratio test. This is my only positive one to pivot on. And so I'll pivot there. And that means that S slack 1 will replace slack 3. And so we'll do row operations to zero out these values. And here we are. We still have an attractive variable. We'll just now pivot until we reach the end of our problem. OK. Most are the only attractive ratio test. So x2 will leave, make the pivot. Now look, nothing is attractive. No variable is attractive. So that means we're optimal. Yay, and here's where we're optimal at this point. x1 is 5. x2 is not in the basis, so it's 0. Slack 1 and slack 2 are 3 and 4, and slack 3 is not in the basis. Notice a few things that's always true about the simplex algorithm. Along the way, our objective function is always improving, even all the way back here from negatives up to 0 in phase 1, and then from 0 up to 10 in phase 2. But we're now optimal. We're finished with the problem. That is how you use the two-phase simplex to uh, use phase one to get feasible and phase two to just finish off your optimization. The only trick is at the beginning of each phase, knowing what costs to put in and updating those costs before moving on. So I hope that makes sense. Um, and I hope you enjoy this video. Thanks for watching.